Hello, uh, I'm from the performance team. My name is Yuri Wiesner, and I'd like to speak about measuring latency with F-Trace. Well, there are several tools to do latency measurement. It's not just F-Trace, but there are cases when one needs to reach for F-Trace. For example, because there are no other means available, uh, one cannot afford it. So, uh, F-Trace exposes a sysfs interface, a tracefs file system, which is usually mounted in syskernel tracing. And F-Trace has its events. Uh, many of them are trace points. This is an example of the raw syscall trace point. And when one lists its directory, there is the enable file, trigger file, hist file, format file, and so on. We'll be mostly interested in the trigger file and the hist file. So uh, basically, whenever one defines an event trigger, this trigger will get executed as long as the trigger is uh, defined, uh, even, even if the event is not enabled. An enabled event is being printed into the trace buffer. A disabled event isn't printed into the trace buffer. One adds a trigger by um, catting or appending the trigger command to the trigger file of each event. And uh, there are various commands uh, enabling and disabling other events printing a stack trace of the current process, executing the event, taking a snapshot of the whole F-trace buffer, switching tracing on and off, creating a histogram, and enabling and disabling other histogram triggers. There is an optional filter for each trigger, which is very useful. Uh, there are expected operators for numeric fields. Comparisons equal equals uh, less than and so on. Uh, you can also compare string fields. The, the most interesting is the glob, which allows you to uh, search for substrings. Uh, then there are logical operators. So one example of an event trigger is actually printing a stack trace if uh, the pref pit, this is for the sketch switch trace point that's that's executed during context switches. So whenever we get a context switch and the process being scheduled out is not the idle process, and the next process is something that starts with system D, we print a stack trace for whatever reason. That doesn't matter. It's just an example. Uh, so one can define uh, the histogram trigger, and this is the most inter one of the most interesting triggers because it has a great potential. Uh, one usually uses it for aggregating trace event data into histograms. So uh, some of the fields of the event are used as keys. Some may be used uh, as values, but there doesn't have to be values because the default value, the hit count, is always there. So you will be accumulating hit count, at least. Then you can define sorting also by the fields which were used as keys. Each histogram can have one or more variables, which are expressions or field values. And uh, each histogram has a size. Uh, this is rather important because often the key that you want to use is the process ID. And given the usual PID max, uh, that's uh, 65,000, and that's just the basic value. Practically, you see much larger values in production. And if you combine this with the fact that the histograms are hash tables with pre-allocated entries, uh, you begin to see the limitations because, because the sizes can be 2 to the 7th up to 2 to, two to the 17th. That's it. Uh, you may run out of hist entries quite soon, especially if you use process IDs as keys. Or if your key is a compound key, then it's even faster. Uh, each, each hist trigger uh, has several hand handlers available, and these perform various actions, and several actions. So there's the on-match handler, 
which uh, causes the current trigger to match another hist trigger. There's the on max a handler which monitors the value of a variable in, and if there is a new maximum value seen, uh, an action is performed and the same goes for the on change handler. Uh, the available actions are the trace action, which is uh, creating a synthetic event. Uh, we will talk about this in more detail. Uh, we can pass a param parameter list to the synthetic event. There's the save action, which saves some fields of the current event, or the snapshot action, which means taking a snapshot of uh, the whole ftrace buffer. There are special keys. Uh, in hist triggers, that's the common CPU, that's the current CPU on which the event is executing right now. Common timestamp is the time in nanoseconds. Stack trace can be used as a key. A very interesting one, if you want to look at stack traces at whatever point uh, in which the event is executed, you can do that with stack trace. And hit count is more for a formality here because it's quite trivial. Uh, there are modifiers that can be used in hist triggers, dot hex, uh, prints, and this is about printing the histograms. So it's the last step when you're viewing the data. So dot hex prints uh, values in hexadecimal. Sim translates addresses into symbol names. Sim offsets, offset adds an offset. Dot syscall translates a syscall ID into the syscall name. Dot exec name prints a process name for the common PID field and no other field. Uh, if the PID is in any other variable, it cannot be resolved. Dot log is uh, the logarithm to the base two of a field or a, of a, or a value. Dot usex is used on the common timestamp value to get a value in microseconds. There is extended error information available, which is very handy if something goes wrong, which it probably will. Um, so here's an example of a histogram trigger command to accumulate, accumulate data, aggregate data from a single event. In this case, this is the event if de is dev start transmit, that's uh, from the networking layer. And the format of this event lists many uh, common fields. Uh, and um, these are the most, the most important is the common PID. Is the, oh, that's un unfortunate is the common PID, which we will use quite a lot. Uh, there are many other fields in this event, but uh, we will use name, which is the name of the network device, queue mapping, which is the queue on which the packet is transmitted, and len, which is the length of the packet. So uh, the histogram, the print FMT, is actually the format for the string that's printed into the, the ftrace buffer. This is just for to have more information about this. Uh, the histogram command is below. So we use the common PID as the key, the first key. A dot exec name will, will mean the name of the process will be displayed. Then the second key is the name of the NIC. Then there's the queue. And for values, we're accumulating the size of the transmitted data. And we cut this to the trigger file of the dev start transmit event. Uh, what you will get when you display the hist file is a table. And the table, again, will list all the keys. So there's the process, there's the nick, there's the queue, and the values is the hit count and the length. So at the very least, this will allow you to calculate the average number of bytes transmitted during the period. Well, if you used Eth tool, you would usually get the same information. So this is a bit needless, but that's just, it's just an example. Uh, the totals below, uh, there are hits. Each histogram maintains the number of hits, which is the number of events that had an entry and were accounted for. The number of, the number of entries is the number of entries spent the number of pre-allocated entries that have been spent and uh, dropped 
means that if, you, if this increases, then you run out of histogram entries and you usually do not want that because you will be missing it, data. Mm. Yes, yes. The sum of hit counts would be the total hits. Yes, it's not, no, the, the table's large. Um, so the histogram trigger, something more useful if you wanted to look at context switches and look at where do processes block and accumulate this information. You can do that quite easily, it's a single command. So you instrument the sketch switch trace point and uh, the histogram that you could use is the common PID translated to exact name again and the stack trace. And you probably could use a filter, I do use a filter, it's uh, I do not want to uh, see the idle process. Uh, so basically the histogram, this is a single histogram entry that you get. So you see the first key is the process name and process ID and the stack trace and we see the hit count. So uh, the net server process executed and waited in this stack this number of times during the period I, I ran this. So this is directly available in the kernel, a single command and you see where processes block and how often. So synthetic events, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a very handy feature because it allows you to combine data from trigger variables or fields of other events into a new user-defined event. So one creates a synthetic event by appending it to the synthetic events file under syskernel tracing and the, there's the event name and the event has one or more variables. So there's always, always a type and the name of the variable. Uh, one removes uh, synthetic events with an exclamation mark prepended to the string. Uh, well, types can be any valid failed type and here's an exhaustive list of types that you can use currently in 15SP5. Those are mostly unsigned and signed integers of various sizes, characters, int, long, PID, and GFP type. Uh, they're limited, but sufficient usually. Uh, so this is about creating the event, but uh, that does not generate the synthetic events. Uh, a synthetic event is generated with the onMatch uh, handler. So whenever the onMatch handler is specified, it mentions uh, the name, the name of the matching event. Here I have just event name, but this, this is a specific event. And the trace action creates this syn synthetic event and passes a parameter list to it. So a simplified example is creating an event, defining two variables, creating the first histogram, and this is for event one, so you choose a key, I chose common PID because that's the most usual key one uses. Uh, the second histogram has to, has to contain the on a match handler and the trace action. Uh, the trace action uh, creates the MySynth my synth event and passes uh, the histogram variables to it. Uh, V1 was, uh, was defined in the first histogram, V2 was defined in the second histogram. Both are visible and you can use them in this way. Uh, so events match when they have matching keys. So the number of the keys and the type of the keys has to be the same. So in this case you're matching PIDs. Uh, So the most important thing about synthetic events is that they are used for displaying data spanning multiple events. So you, you combine events. Uh, often when trace points aren't enough, one needs to create K probes and K red probes with F trace. Well, creating K a K probe is done simply by appending a string to K probe events, the same for K red probe. 
uh, one puts a P for probe or R for a red probe, then, then there's the name of the probe and the function being probed. For K probes, you can have an optional offset. What follows is uh, the argument list. So you specify the names of the arguments and the expressions to evaluate. Uh, K probes offer a variety of expressions that you can evaluate and fetch uh, from kernel space. You can print the values in registers, which is the most obvious one. You can format them as various strings, whatever is appropriate in the situation. One can fetch the values of struct members. Uh, this example is uh, the pointer is in the RSI register that's on at x86. Well, we can print strings as well. We can print user, user space strings. That would be the use string keyword. We can print the nth argument passed to the probed function. That's only on function entry, and we can fetch the return value. For k-probes, that's usually the most sensible value one can use for a k-probe. So, examples of latency measurements. I will be showing time spent in functions, the perennial favorite time spent in syscalls, scheduling latency, and uh, when one is able to measure latency, uh, this opens a new way to trigger F-trace snapshots. So, time spent in functions, one usually goes about it by creating a k-probe and a k-ret probe for the function of interest, then a synthetic event, and then there's a histogram trigger for the k-probe and another for the k-ret probe, which generates the synthetic event. Synthetic event. <laughs> uh, well, you can optionally enable this event with a filter or you can uh, aggregate the data from the synthetic event into another histogram, which is often useful and which is what I often do because I simply cannot afford to have large traces. So I prefer to produce histograms. Uh, I will be showing secret as an example. So here's, here's the call graph. Uh, this is a typical, typical situation or the only situation in which secret is called. That's the read call of uh, the PS process. So we see VFS read secret and secret iterator. So, uh, TRC is syskernel tracing from now on. Uh, we create a k-probe. Um, basically, at the beginning of secret, we create a k-red probe at the end of secret. We create a synthetic event which is eponymous but doesn't have to be. It has got to have one argument. In this case, it's the latency, the time spent in the function. So... Uh, Basically, the first histogram stores the timestamp. The second histogram computes the latency, that's the delta, and passes the delta to the created synthetic events and matches, matches the secret uh, k-probe. And if you enable this synthetic event, you get the trace as you see below. You see some latency values. This is unfiltered. This, this is with a filter. I specified a filter of 50 microseconds and you see 50, 50,000 or more, which is what we expect. So, but the most interesting uh, use case is of course getting another histogram. So uh, you use the common, common PID as a key and uh, the log logarithm to the base two of latency as the second dimension in this histogram. And you can, yes, and you accumulate hit count. That's it. Uh, so basically the histogram looks like this. So we see pro a process name, the latency it took, and the number of times, which is already sufficient to gain a picture. This is more, a more an example closer to real life. Um, that one shows you that you can fetch the show up. Basically the show up here uh, fetches the function that, uh, so you dereference the file pointer passed in the DI register. 
you, you get private data, private data points to op and op points to show. So you have three dereferences to make in the k-probe. Nevertheless, you get, uh, when you do this, uh, you get an address and the k-red probe st stores a return value. So we store the timestamp in the first histogram. We compute the latency in the second histogram. And uh, since the event was already defined with the show up, we store the show up, the number of bytes read, and uh, the delta, which is the latency. And we can accumulate, um, uh, aggregate the data into a third histogram, which has the P and the show up as keys, and the value is latency, and we add the on max trigger. The on max trigger watches for the delta and stores the maximum latency value and saves the number of bytes transferred. So in this example, uh, let's take Velociraptor, that's the second uh, but last line, uh, the, uh, and uh, we see that uh, it executed a proc single show, the hit count was 96, so we can already compute average latency, and we see what the maximum latency was for this particular process and this particular show operation. Uh, time spent in functions doesn't have to be done with synthetic event. This is synthetic events. This is an example without the synthetic event. Uh, the results are similar. The only difference is that you get just the max and the average, and that's it. You cannot enable the event and uh, filter, filter the output. So time spent in syscalls is... Uh, is, is often an often performed task, so one uses the sysenter and six sysexit trace points. The most important field is the syscall ID. In these events, because this is what we will you will use to identify the synth synth event, we don't have to create any k probes or k red probes. The first histogram uses the common PID. Uh, so whenever a process executes a syscall, uh, we uh, define a histogram on sysenter, store the timestamp. The second histogram computes the latency and generates a syscall synthetic event with the syscall ID and latency value. And I also create a histogram here, uh, which is the process names and syscall IDs translated. You will see shortly. This is the trace, not that interesting, uh, but you see ID7 pole that uh, this is a blocking syscall and you see a large value because you also count the sleep, sleep the time for which the process slept. Uh, this, um, this, this is the histogram. As I said, you get the syscall, uh, syscall IDs translated to names, which is very, very handy. You don't have to look those up. So from this histogram, you can basically see at least the average time the syscall took. You could also store maximum values with the on max trigger. Uh, please, questions after, sorry? Uh, uh, scheduling latency, all I wanted to say is don't get all crazy about tracing. If you have kernel sketch stats, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, sketch stats allow you to measure the average and maximum scheduling latency with tools already available in the kernel. So do not do tracing if you um, can make do with this type of information. Oh, well, uh, scheduling latency uh, uses the sked waking trace point and sked switch trace point. And basically what you do is uh, the sked waking trace, trace point uh, a trigger is defined on this one. You save the com, that's the name of the process being, being woken up, the process ID and priority, and the key is the process ID. So you wake up something, uh, use the process ID key. Uh, then uh, it gets uh, added to the run queue and a context context switch is bound to occur, and the next PID, if this matches the process being woken up, you compute the latency, and uh, the on-match trigger matches this with the sked waking trace point. 
and uh, you create this, you generate the synthetic event. Again, you can define histograms uh, to actually uh, aggregate the data of this synthetic event. Here's a trace, and you will see something's missing here at the bottom. Uh, the very last line is the net server process of a specific PID woken up in the context of another NetPerf process, which is nowhere to be found in this trace entry, which tells you you're missing something. Uh, this scheduling latency is uh, allows you to see the the histogram, the latency histogram, and the the thing you were missing was scheduling latency after uh, being preempted. Uh, so in order to to be able to compute that. Um, basically, together with uh, the wake-up latency, one needs to define a K-probe and use the get switch trace point again. Uh, so basically, uh, the first histogram uh, checks for processes that aren't the idle process and were scheduled out in a running state or after being preempted. The second histogram generates generates the event and uh, basically that's it because then there's the uh, again the same histogram you could trigger a stack trace when the latency exceeds in this case this is 20 millisecond milliseconds you can print a stack trace for the process so it's an example of another trigger where you can get more specific information this is how the trace looks like. Uh, Skedlet wake events alternate with Skedlet pre. It's more or less how it's supposed to be now. Now you're not missing anything. So the takeaway is if, takeaway is if you want to measure scheduling latency, you have to measure both uh, scheduling latency uh, due to wake ups and scheduling latency after being preempted. Well. The cost of uh, histogram triggers is large and much larger than BPF. So if you can, you should use BPF and not F-trace. Triggering snapshots is very interesting, but I'm afraid we don't have time for that. Thank you for your attention. Can I have a question, please? Yes. Uh, so I noticed that you, when you are measuring the function latency or the scheduling latency, so you save the timestamp at the first event, and then you use it as the reference in the second event. Yes. And this uh, data point, it's saved in some buffers, per CPU buffers allocated by F-Trace. When you, it I don't think it's event. per CPU, but it's in the histogram entry. So uh, the first. Uh, the first histogram created an entry, and uh, the second histogram lo locates this specific entry and retrieves the timestamp value. And there's a very pe pe peculiar rule in F-Trace that if you use a value in an expression, it's, uh, then it becomes null for any other use. So. Uh, it, uh, it does not, this is because you do not want to generate any fake events. If you hit the uh, other event uh, later on, you, you don't read the timestamp again. So yes, it's stored in the histogram entry. And so at the timestamp field, that's predefined, or can you store your own field or define your own fields in the event registration? Oh, uh, if you, uh, in this case, uh, you do because you're using K a K-probe. So you can go crazy, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as you don't mind dereferencing structures and looking up uh, offsets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a second question, because I know that BPF trace also somehow provides this functionality, like measuring functional latency and stuff. And I wonder, does it, under the hood, does it use uh, these uh, low-level stuff, or does it only only uh, use BPF and uh, track all the data on its own in some BPF structures? Uh, I'm not sure what BPF trace does, sorry. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, what BPF trace? That, that's a command? Yes. Uh, I believe it does some stuff with BPF. So, so basically, it uses a trace under the hood 
uh, yeah, sorry. So, so I believe BPF trace uses F trace under the hood to trigger the BPF program, mm -hmm. but uh, but then the BPF program itself is responsible for storing the information in the histogram and, and basically doing all the accounting and pretty printing and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. That's that's already like done with BPF and stuff okay. around that. Thanks. Right, right. I, I don't think it uses histograms. They are far too slow. Yes, please. Uh, may I have a question about uh, the function? Uh, if we do not, if I do not know the function name, we just have binary, we have symbol. Uh, we do not know the functional name. Uh, is it possible to use this method to, to track the time stamp span? You need to have either the name or the address. Or the address. The address. Yeah. Mm, for, uh, uh, for example, if we only have binary, yeah. uh, we, 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 do, we do not know the code, but I can, uh, is it possible to track some function or, or some, some symbol uh, time span? Or, uh, uh, you'd be talking about U probes in this case, because uh, unless you're debugging Windows. Uh, no, <laughs> basically, no, curves, curves, right? it, about uses. This is kernel tracing, so kernel tracing. you always know the name of the function. But if, if you just have a binary, you'd uh, look up the address and use the address and create a U probe instead of K probe. It's a okay. bit different, but similar. Uh, you'd mention the name of the, the object and, uh, and the address. It's, it's slightly, it's similar. Okay, thank you. It can be done, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your attention.